and you thought a raptor was scary. Now if you recognise a dinosaur, odds are you recognise a pterosaur. Now whilst they're not technically dinosaurs, they are synonymous with dinosaurs given the time that they were alive and the fact that cladistically they are just about as close to a dinosaur as you can get without actually being a dinosaur. Now these guys were not only the first vertebrates to ever take to the skies, but they also gave us the largest animals to ever fly in Earth's history. And may I introduce the biggest animal to ever fly, Quetzalcoatlus Northropi. But how did it actually manage to fly? How did it even get to that point and being so big? Well, stick around for the rest of the video and we will find that out. But in the meantime, let's take a look at what kind of animal it actually was. Quetzalcoatlus was a member of the Asdarchids, a group of pterosaurs characterised by strangely large heads and long stiff necks in comparison to their bodies and wings, as well as, you know, being fucking massive. Asdarchids were the largest pterosaurs and whilst there are some potential competitors, Quetzalcoatlus is currently officially the largest of the group. Now with a wingspan of over 10 metres or around 33 feet, and standing as tall as a giraffe, this thing would have been an intimidating sight to behold. Now weight estimates have been a little bit more vague, but currently they fall somewhere around the 200 kilometers mark, or around 440 pounds. Quetzalcoatlus was first discovered in 1971 in the Javelina Formation in Texas by then graduate student Douglas A. Lawson when he found a humerus and a partial fourth digit which would have made up the wing. Now Quetzalcoatlus has been known about and even present in pop culture for a really long time but believe it or not its existence was actually doubted by many scientists since the genus was considered problematic right up until 2021. So where did this giant pterosaur hang its giant hat? Well, Quetzalcoatlus was found in North American rocks from 68 to 66 million years ago and given its status as a flying giant animal, it's probably safe to assume that it inhabited places all over the country, including the famous Hell Creek Formation, soaring above the likes of Triceratops and T-Rex. Many specimens have also been found, especially nearby Alamosaurus. Now it was a subtropical, moderately humid climate with many estuary systems and rocky mountains with a warm shallow sea dividing America at the time. Now many of the environments at this time resembled much of North America today with abundant conifer and oak forests full of flowering plants as well as some swampier areas and wide open plains. Now with this in mind, many over the years have asked what and how did it eat? Now paleontologists have bounced between the ideas that Quetzalcoatlus was a scavenger or a piscivorous skim feeder, i.e. flying over the surface of the water and scooping up fish as it went. However, it didn't quite have the right beak for scavenging and it was also way too big to pull off the kind of manoeuvres needed for skim fishing. That wasn't actually until 2008 that Darren Naish and Mark Witten pointed out the most likely solution. They stated that Quetzalcoatlus shared many traits with a lot of terrestrial stalking predators, including fore and hind limb proportions closer to many quadruped mammals, at least more so than their other pterosaur cousins. Basically, despite appearances, Quetzalcoatlus was not as awkward and clumsy as it looked on the ground, and it was probably capable of chasing you down without flapping its wings even once. Good luck getting to sleep tonight, imagining this thing chasing you down. So why go to all this effort just to grow really massive and still be able to fly? Well, the why is something that we'll probably never know since the possible explanations are almost endless. 
but the how is slightly more interesting. In fact, some paleontological horns have actually been locked over the years, either whether Quetzalcoatlus could even fly at all. Henderson and many others concluded that powered flight simply wasn't possible and that if it did ever hit the skies, it was long, slow, soaring flight gliding over thermal winds. Now with less of its time actually flying around, that would explain the better terrestrial adaptations that it had over its other pterosaur cousins. But at the same time, many others have also argued that despite the size, Quetzalcoatlus and other Asdarkids were very much capable of powered flight. Now these other studies were based on computational models as well as anatomical studies, but whichever way you look at it, it always comes back to the same thing, which is its weight. Now the weight would have been in the lower estimates in the powered flight models. So Quetzalcoatlus's flight abilities came down to how much junk it had in the trunk, which we still can't seem to agree on. The likelihood is that if you did find yourself in Lake Cretaceous, North America, this guy would be soaring above your head. It's just the takeoff that may need some more confirmation. Now the leading theory at the time of this video is that Quetzalcoatlus actually had incredibly powerful hind limbs, powerful enough to launch itself up to eight feet into the air before giving a few powerful flaps of its wings and then just ride in the thermal air currents for potentially thousands of miles. But what do you think of Quetzalcoatlus? What flight capabilities do you think it actually had? Let's start a discussion in the comment section. As well as that, please leave a like and consider subscribing as it would help me out massively. But for now, until next time. So Quetzalcoatlus's flight a bit blah blah. blah.